morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today at our Bible study, March 22nd, March 23rd, 2019. We are recording from the Plainfield Christian Science Church Independent, Plainfield, New Jersey, and we welcome you all. And today, our moderator is Betty from California. Good morning, and I'll start with the quote. It's our great quote, our great way shower, steadfast to the end in his obedience to God's laws, demonstrated for all time and people the supremacy of good over evil and the superiority of spirit over matter. The miracles recorded in the Bible, which had before seemed to me supernatural, grew divinely natural and apprehensible through the though the uninspired interpreters ignorantly pronounced Christ's healing healing miraculous, miraculous instead of seeing therein the operation of the divine law. And that's from Retrospection and Introspection by Mary Baker Eddy. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Well, there's that inspired, uninspired again. Shows that uh, you can't really read the Bible without asking God for inspiration when you read it. Otherwise, you're just going to miss it all. You don't get the spiritual understanding of the promises. Right. Right. Otherwise, it's just another... uh, Another novel, right? What comes to me is <clears throat> good. Only good is what, and this is how God does it. And if we remain under his laws, man governed by law, then we will have this good. And it's it's a natural, natural from him, not something, you know, miraculous like we always... Oh, a lot of people so you know, it was such a miracle. But that's just how God does it, if we understand who he is and how his laws really govern us, if we become aware of it. Thank you. <laughs> yes, the good alone is natural. Evil is not natural. Yeah, that idea of miracles implies that there's a law of evil that God intervenes and breaks at times. Humanizes God, doesn't it? Well, one of the definitions of miracle is supernatural act not explained by known laws of nature. So, we know as this bringing out the whole session. These are the divine laws, and the divine laws are what we are under. And they overrule the mortal mind laws, human laws. And the more we think of it, the more we thank God for his goodness, thank God for all the wonderful blessings that he's bestowed on us in our life. We magnify it. Mary and Mother Jesus said in Luke, my soul doth magnify the Lord. The more we think of the enduring the good and the true, the more they will seem natural, and we will have them more in our own lives. I think it's in Watches, Prayers, and Arguments where Mrs. Betty says we have to daily know uh, to, to annul this law of impossibility, to know that all things are possible to God. Keep yourself in that right state of thought. Otherwise, you, you can hear yourself saying, oh, that'll never happen, or that's, you know, that's just impossible. I, I mean, it, it happens. Drop into the negative mind, and, and you, your expectation drops, and you don't expect good. So we have to work to keep our thoughts lifted. 
And Jesus expected us to go and do the works, and how would we do that if we thought it was just a miracle that was done by Christ Jesus? Well, exactly. And those who profess that these are all miracles, not natural law, it's really a cop-out, isn't it? Because it's their excuse for not striving to understand the divine law better, isn't it? Mentions in the narrative about Jesus' steadfast obedience and that he's the way shower. And I think, for me, the idea is the better that I obey, the clearer it is that these laws are natural, not miraculous. Yeah, and it is part of certainly the old theology that teaches you they are miracles. I remember in one of our Bible studies, it was about weather and reading in a commentary, saying flat out that, well, where Jesus stilled the storm, well, he, he that was something Jesus could do, but of course we can't do that. He said it flat <laughs> out. <laughs> The priests in the early part of the 19th century agreed on that. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. So, this is something we all demonstrate. Control of the weather, of course, through through God. And I had an example yesterday. We On my computer, it said we were going to have a dreadful storm, a violent storm, and people had to watch out everywhere, and trees were going to come down and all this stuff. And I knew that God was in control of the weather, and I just declared that. And the storm came and went in 10 minutes, and that was the end of it. Wonderful, Mary. I was happy about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you've had, you've had several. You've given testimonies about various things that have happened, as has others of you. And so it should be part of our, our life, part of our work, part of our expectation. Mrs. Eddy had designated people in her home to work on the weather every day. And certainly you work for it in your area, but then you work for everybody, everywhere. Part of what we do. And do we think it's a miracle? No. We understand it's part of God's law. We use the power, but we put it into operation by our prayer, our acknowledgement, our gratitude. Thank you, Fairly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else? And in the definition of miracle that Mary read, uh, that where it says it can't be explained by laws of nature. Well, what's referred to as laws of nature there are the false beliefs that there are material laws. And I like the idea that a miracle is something that can't be explained by human belief or so-called material sense, which Mrs. Eddy explains, is an absurd phrase. But nevertheless, it's what a lot of people believe. The other day, I, I got myself a new Kindle, which I'm very excited about. Gary said it has enough gigabytes for the whole Library of Congress. <laughs> 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 but, but anyway, I saw this book that sounded very interesting, because it's amazing. I mean, these Kindles, they're not only you can read them, but you can buy books. <laughs> so anyway, it was about doctors just saying these, these supernatural occurrences, healings that have, that have happened, um, a whole list of different doctors. I haven't read it yet, but I, I think it'll be very interesting, because they have no explanation for it. And in what I did read, of course, prayer was behind these, quote, supernatural occurrences. So they're happening all the time. And um, as, as in this book, 
as, as in our own lives as Christian scientists, they're happening. They just don't make the front page of the newspaper every day. No. But in your own heart, rejoice, acknowledge them, praise God, because the tendency is to just say, oh, what happened anyway, or, you know, some strange phenomena that caused it, or... or aren't we lucky? Yeah, or it was just good luck. And the no, medical some thing. medical thing made it happen. That's... Oh, right, that's yeah. right, yes, uh-huh. What were you going to say, Lil? The medical profession doesn't want us to get that. They want to keep That's their true. control. That's right. Yes, they do, in selling their drugs. So. I, I sit on, um, because of my work, I have to sit sometimes on what they call rounds and... Um, uh, it's a uh, exercise for me in the patient and uh, in um, demonstrating Christian Science because I have to hear all these um, pr- uh, pronostics and diagnosis and so on. And it always amazes me that if they are discussing a patient and the patient somehow defies all odds and, and is out of the woods, so to speak, how immediately everybody looks at each other like, oh, that's impossible, it cannot happen. Or, or, or there's uh, also a, uh, uh, a prophecy like, oh, that is going to relapse or it's going to be, um, <laughs> that's not going to be a long-term uh, thing. And, and it makes me angry. I have to watch myself on that because I want to tell them, you know, who the heck are you guys? <laughs> <laughs> Or I want to tell the people that this is not so. You're not God. And I have to really bite my tongue many times. I, I hope I still have a tongue by the time I'm done. <laughs> well, this is in your thought is knowing the truth there to correct yes. that. Mm-hmm. Your, your, see, your, your correct thinking is a power mm-hmm. in that situation. And unless God directs you, you don't have to say anything. Well, I must say, she's demonstrating that in many ways, <laughs> many other ways. So. Yeah. Yes. I, I remember one particular one that um, was in hospice, and when they usually put you in hospice, it's because, you know, medical has said, okay, well, there's nothing more we can do for you. And it was, uh, the, the person was admitted at Calvary, one of the biggest hospitals here in New York uh, for uh, hospice care. And was my patient, and she and she got out. She was discharged because I guess she wasn't dying on the time that they uh, uh, diagnosed uh, her. And I remember I was very gleeful, I have to say, when I told them in rounds, well, she was discharged. And I know everybody was looking at me like, impossible, but it was. She's still alive. <laughs> and wonderful. Jim Dibel was put in hospice, Jim from Arizona. And he, yeah. it lasts long, and that was, I don't know how many years ago now, and he went on to take over the writing of our newsletter. Which he still does. Which he still does, passing out signs and help to whomever he can meet. And Joyfully telling us how beautiful it is in Arizona. And joyfully <laughs> telling us how beautiful it is in Arizona, whether it's snowing or desert. Or <laughs> <laughs> and there are others of you who were given up and are now... Going in one way or another. Theme, yes. So thank you very much, Pilar. And, and this is the naturalness of miracles, but how we must, well, just praise him, praise him, praise him, praise him, praise the everlasting king. Acknowledge them and realize they are going on today because the human mind does just what Pilar was describing. Oh, that couldn't happen. And, it just it negates it. And if you're in the wrong mind or someone else's, that's exactly what they'll say about it. This is the veil that covers, eventually, the healing power of the Christ. So make sure we're not part of that, but part of this veil. If I get busy working for God and see where it all goes, I love that Psalm 118. I will not die, but I will live and proclaim what the Lord has done. Yes. Amen. That's right.
just yesterday, something happened to me. I was talking to my practitioner, and we were discussing a problem. And uh, I don't know, it, a number of quotes came to me very comfortably. And I think there were about six or eight of them. And I wrote so so much so I wrote two of them to my practitioner. And it was a very, very wonderful healing message. And I wish to say thank you for it. Well, thank you, Jim. It certainly was. Jim is a wonderful watcher. He, he's right there. You all hear him every week. And it's, God blesses him for his faithfulness. And he's always thanking our shepherd for every yes. good thing. Thank you, shepherd. And joyful. Joyful, joyful always. And inspiring. Yeah. No longer needs glasses. How inspiring is that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Are we ready to go? All right. Topic, Miracle or Divine Law? Bible readings were from John 6. And the first question is, what was the miracle or divine law that Jesus demonstrated for the great company? And that was John 6, 1 through 13. The law of abundance. Well, he fed a lot of people with very little food, supposedly, right? He had a lot left over. They had more left over than he started out with. Twelve baskets? Wow. Mm-hmm. He fed 5,000. So what's that all about? I guess it demonstrates that um, it shows it shows us that God will supply all our needs, no matter what the situation is. Like they were in the desert, or they were in an area that they couldn't get food easily, and yet God took care of of His people. Thank you. I think it comforts us to know that you know, no matter where we are, no matter what. God is present, therefore his unlimited source of supply is also present. And we in- include this. And if we you know, work on knowing that that's what is, then we will find our supply, no matter where we are. Jesus looked, Jesus was always aware of God's presence, that unlimited supply, where we would always go to and the material figuring out first. He always was God first. You know, I have sometimes uh, 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 thought about when you pass on, what about your supply? And this is the answer. Passing on. (laughs) Passing on. What's what's that all about? (laughs) Well, we'll never be separated from the Father in that abundance. Absolutely. So, you know, a lot of people refer to this as one of the, quote, miracles that Jesus performed. What's wrong with that statement? Jesus performing a miracle? Putting on some magic show here? And that only he can do? I think one of the problems with that, of course, is which is wrong, but it doesn't seem very repeatable if it's a miracle. But if it's law, it's repeatable. That's it. Yeah, and what is what is the law? I mean, there's a state there's a statement in Science and Health that everybody is very familiar with about divine law. Divine law. Love always has met and always will meet every human need. 
Right. Yeah. That's a law. It was divine love that brought these people to Jesus in the first place. To hear, to hear the message that God had for them to hear. And Jesus obeyed. He gave them the message. When they were hungry, it was divine love that provided the increase. And it was Jesus' obedience to that divine love that didn't doubt that it could happen. Because of the Thursday watch and my practitioner talking to me about self-mesmerism, I've been thinking that all he did was show them that they had everything they need. It was there for them. It just sort of broke through. <laughs> yeah, and there that watch message Thursday was interesting. If you, you can see how different things were coupled, and it said self-mesmerism keeps you from seeing the truth. So if you have self-mesmerized yourself into thinking there's limited supply and you can't possibly do that, you will not see the chariots of fire surrounding you, all, all that there, all the abundant at good, because you're self-mesmerized, and sometimes it's certainly handed down among generations to gen generations. That's why it, it has to stop. You know that we do have abundance. I find it interesting how this week's lesson definitely follows last week on supply. And I don't know if there's a list here. Well, she wrote on the forum about from finance, which is by Signal Young, which you all should know and read and study. It's a wonderful explanation of supply. But he says, it was thanksgiving and recognition that multiplied the loaves and fishes to the 5,000. Thanksgiving, which brings the expanse of quality into manifestation, is done from the sheer joy of the presence whether you have a single thing or not, whether you have been a prodigal and lost, what matter little things? They will come into place automatically. They cannot help themselves. I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me is an actual mathematical law. It really arrested my attention. It is wonderful, the rejoicing, not because of victory or things, but because of presence. If your joy is still on the outside looking for symbols, you are still empty. No thanksgiving. The way Jesus stood before the 5,000 witnesses for lack gives us an idea of the confidence which is born of the recognition of the natural functioning of God. He lifted up his eyes to heaven and gave thanks. What is your move? Watch. When will you stop trying to get things and see the presence of God? The spirit of the consciousness of the presence of God is the source of all supply. Not some supply. All supply. When you know this, it will be wherever you are and whatever you need. Practice the presence of God, and you will find you have all you need when you need it. Don't look for things or feel, you wrote the other wonderful article, if, if, I, if you say, I want. If you say, I want and don't have, your, that human law is coming on top of you. Say, no, Father has given me all things. What, did, what is that beautiful statement from the prodigal son? Son, all that I all have. All that I have is dying. Yes. Yeah. That's you. That's you, and it's God's promise to you. Don't get in the way of its fulfillment. And be grateful for it. Thank him for it. I think that's where a lot of people forget. Well, yeah, and, and, they, and they just take it for granted, and, and that's why it's such a, a sin, really, 
to spoil your children so that they just have so much, so much, so much. They don't even know how to be grateful. And, and it, it's not earned. It's not appreciated. It should be so appreciated. Part of appreciation is in the care of it. And then Mrs. Eddy's article called Possession, which is on our website, she says, practice having a sense of possession of all things. Taking possession of what God gives us is the step leading to God giving us what we desire. If you take possession of what is at hand for you, it becomes the loaves and fishes for you, the basis of multiplication. Jesus' first question was, how many loaves have you? You must first have the consciousness of something to multiply. Keep practicing. This is mine until the spirit of possession is gained, and you will feel all things are mine. You take what you have, however little that is, and expand upon it. If you don't, and if you hoard it, it's like the story of the talents the Bible. That little bit is going to dry up. You take what you have and expand upon it. It grows. Didn't we? That was what we studied last week with the widow and the oil, right? She took the little she had. Everybody's given a little something. Got a little bit somewhere. <laughs> take what you've got, however, however tiny. And, and see it as ex coming from God, give thanks for it, share it, expand it. In both these instances, they were ready to share the widow and Christ Jesus. And it, it just, it fills the need of the, of the time, whatever that need is, it's there. There is also another very, I thought, a very beautiful commentary about what are your five loaves and two fishes. And he first, first brings out the point. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. The Jewish feast of Passover was near. Jesus raised his eyes and saw that a large crowd was coming to and then it goes in, it says that the text, this is what the person says, the text says that Jesus saw a large crowd. I wonder if we do. Generally today we think of decline, declining numbers when it comes to church life. This is because we tend to think in term of, terms of members, whereas Jesus more clearly thinks in terms of those who need to be reached. Think of that. The whole world is our church. Everybody, everybody needs to be reached with this science. And I thought very gratefully, we are doing that with our website. Certainly we're not confined to this little church in Plainfield. Good God. <laughs> <laughs> no, we see the whole world. It said that Jesus sees the world as a vineyard, as a mission field. So again, lift up your vision. What are you seeing? And, t and then take the little bit you have. So we took the little bit we had and put it on a website. And man, that thing is multiplying like crazy, isn't it? <laughs> it's multiplying here, there, and everywhere. Because freely we have received, so freely we give. And guess what? When you freely give what God gives you, God keeps giving you more and more and more. It is a law of the universe. It makes sense that, that everybody's in the church, too, because nothing can be outside the structure of truth and love. Nothing is outside of God's universe. Anything that thinks it is, is a mistake. And, and I think that this has all come about naturally to us. I would, I would certainly imagine all of you pray in this way and you, and you watch as you are, including all mankind. 
mission of this truth goes out to reach those who need it. So we, we don't see declining numbers. See? Seven and a half billion, at least. <laughs> <laughs> no limits. <laughs> Absolutely no, no limits. No limits whatsoever. And that's just yeah, think. Go ahead, Florence. Well, I think it ties in with this um, statement by Mrs. Eddy on page 494 of uh, Science and Health, the law that uh, Gary referred to. The latter part of it is not stated often, but I, I feel it very strongly. It says that it is not well to imagine that Jesus demonstrated the divine power to heal only for a select number or for a limited period of time. Since to all mankind and in every hour, Divine love supplies all good. Uh, I think it's just a beautiful, complete statement for you know all the devastation supposedly going on around the world right now. And I been knowing that for them because God is there and their, their needs will be supplied. That is beautiful. Thank you. I, I often use that thought in, during my watch. Everywhere, in every hour, divine love is supplying all good. And he is. This is just a mesmerism that says he is not. And remember, yes. on the um, noteworthy, noteworthy news, one that Arthur said again, that person who went to a country in Africa with a suitcase full of clothes mm -hmm. to give to the orphans. And, and it kept replenishing itself. To give out clothes and shoes and then to turn and, and there were more clothes and shoes in her suitcase. She went home with a, <laughs> with a bag full of clothes after she thought giving everything out. And I'm sure that she didn't make that story up. Why would she? And you see, again, it's like Pilar said, who the human mind, oh, that's not true. She having a daydream or something. Well, it is true. Why wouldn't it be true? This is God's law, and many of you have experienced it in wonderful cases of supply, and it, sometimes it comes in ways you least expect it. Virgin talks about where it says that um, John 6, around um, 8 to 10, now there was much grass in the place. He says, when Christ bids men to sit down, he has a dainty carpet for the, them to sit upon. And it was so beautiful to me. I never thought about that. And it's just like you're talking about now, um, even with our website. It's not, it's not just giving out. It's a beautiful website. It's so just the love and the beauty and the grace that's expressed in it, and I've seen it operate in this church where needs and stuff aren't just met, but there's this, this incredible beauty and um, tenderness and care that just unfolds. And I know Miss Steady did it even when she fed people, and it's been something I've been learning here that is just profound. What is that? Was it an email you got this week? Oh, yeah. Really? Really? Sure. Okay. I'll probably read it Wednesday, too. But you got to, Jeremy, and we are hearing, and I know Florence is too, we're hearing new people every week contacting us. Some just, someone from California interested saying that he would like to have an independent church and was asking questions for that. Go ahead. So, dear brethren in Christ, accept the my greetings from France. I am Pastor Mark, an independent teacher and preacher. I just got an opportunity to do some visits to some countries, and I built some houses, churches, in different areas in Asia, India, Bangladesh, Nepal, Pakistan, and Thailand. I found people need the teaching of the biblical truth. I searched out a lot of from the internet, and the Holy Spirit led me to Plainfield Church's website. I read it thoroughly and found an amazing work and teaching, especially the language section, which
experience is really heart-touching and very useful to win souls to God. In this regard, I need some help to get the Scalebler Carpenter's book 500 Watching Points into Hindi and Urdu. I have seen the wonderful work of Hindi and Urdu weekly lessons. Is it possible to provide them? So we are going to start now. One watching point about a week? Yeah, just one one per week per language. I mean, as we can get. I reached out to Carla today for Spanish. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Any of you, we, we're so grateful. See, this is the fruit of our international translation. And uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful idea. I know 500 watching points, when I got it, I couldn't put it down. And to do would just because it's overwhelming to try to do it all. I know at one point Uta was trying to do the whole book in German. But just take one at a time and get it out there. We'll just keep adding. Um, this is taking the two loaves of fishes, taking what we have and multiplying it. And it's infinite. Mary used to like the word innumerable. <laughs> <laughs> No end to it. Infinite. It goes on and on and on. And sometimes I think, you know, people say, well, who's your teacher? Well, Martha Wilcox, not to mention, of course, Mrs. Betty, Martha Wilcox, Kimball, Carpenter, Eustace, the greatest teachers of all time. Thank you very much to all Thank of you. those things. And not to the mention, Bible, yes. <laughs> Bible, science and health, prose works. These are our teachers. Do we need more than that? So see it multiplying and rippling, the ripple effect. You don't know where it's going. But lift up your eyes and see the crowd. Okay? See that crowd. So, so what does Mrs. Betty say about the giving a, giving a cup? Give a cup of cold, cold water. Cold water. Yeah. And never fear the consequences. Yeah. It wasn't Mrs. Betty, but somebody else. Well, some science and health. Yeah. Never fear the consequences. Yeah. Oh, it is. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> A cup of cold water. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Billions, what did she say? Millions of seekers for truth. Truth. Unprejudiced minds. Unprejudiced minds. Mind. Yes. Yeah. Science It'll and health. Research. Yep. The remnant out there waiting, looking, and searching. <clears throat> and again, you know, that this, this article goes on to say sometimes it can seem overwhelming, but look, it's God that's doing this. But use what we have, and, and it'll just, like popcorn, keep popping, keep multiplying. And it's all, it's all on his shoulders. Uh, he did say the fields are ripe for harvest. Right? Yes, yes so. they are. Yeah. And even Jesus did not perform miracles. He obeyed God and let God use him. That's why it didn't overwhelm Jesus. I mean, if he thought that this was personal, can you imagine how overwhelmed he would feel? Stated later, the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. And that's, and that's true for each one of us to the extent that we allow him. And, uh, you know, Jesus, in, in his meekness, was governed by God, so then the governess to direct and control as the actions of, or conduct of men. He totally was, you know, subject to God's control. So, of course, naturally, the laws of God were evident in his living. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When we use what we have and acknowledge that we're, saying, we're, we're giving thanks for what God has given us, and of course it gets more and more. There's also another. There's also another side to that, and the recollections of Mary Baker Eddy with James Gilman at one dinner that we're going to have strawberries for dessert. And uh, he loved them, but after the beautiful discussions that Mrs. Eddy had, he had no appetite for them. When he uh, talked to her about it, she said that uh, 
that was the spiritual bread that overcomes the uh, material eating. And uh, in the foreword to that book, Albert Carpenter writes that, uh, this is that he once said, it is not necessary to eat as much as we do even now. And uh, what he says is that she knew that God is never insulted when we use his power, even the smallest details. The matter of our daily meals, for instance, how necessary it becomes to make a demonstration to see a divine symbolism in food, let it represent God instead of animal magnetism. And it will be transformed into manna from heaven, whereas food viewed materially leads to greater dependence on matter, and hence into greater bondage. That is beautiful. Where was that from? This is a, a book about uh, Christ and Christmas doing the uh, drawings by James Gilman. And uh, this, what I just read, is the foreword by Gilbert Carpenter, and that's on XXVIII. So that would be 28 in the foreword. And unfortunately, the part on the strawberries, I've been looking all morning and I haven't found it, but a lot of other interesting stuff. Well, that that you read from Christ Christmas, please please put that on the forum. That's beautiful. And it's so true. Now, that's the answer to people, you know, struggling with weight problems. Um, because there's no answer, really, in all these dieting. And goodness me, it's just everywhere, all the time. And people are just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Very, very good. We could put it in the Liberator, too. Thank you very much, Mike. Yeah, that was beautiful. Thank you. I, I, I wanted to say that this, this discussion reminds me of the first, I believe, 300 years of Christianity. There were many healings going on um, all the time until um, as the church decided it would write down some creeds and take power and and make it a ecclesiastical organization, and then um, the primitive Christianity kind of turned into um, what what we see now as old theology. Um, but it's it's beautiful to think of these early workers in the I think first three hundred years of Christianity um, doing so called miracles, but they were living the laws that Jesus had taught them. And then it, it quietly sort of faded away. And so this, this just reminds me of the Christian science restoring primitive Christianity and the purity of it. Yes, and that was yep, her intent absolutely. for the church to primitive Christianity and, and how Christ healing power. She has that in the manual. There is one, one other very important point, there are many in this story, but Elizabeth wrote, too, about it on the forum that John six twelve. when they were filled, he said unto the disciples, gather up the fragments that they remain, that nothing be lost. Jesus instructed his disciples to put away for future use the remaining food, twelve baskets full, not to waste God's gift. Gather up the fragments. It is only mentioned in John, but a good lesson that although God provides abundantly, we are to cherish this abundance by being good stewards of it. And quote, though he had power to provide any quantity of food, yet he has here taught us that the bounties of providence are not to be squandered. In all things, the Savior set us an example of frugality, though he had an infinite supply at his disposal. He was himself economical, though he was Lord of all. If he was thus saving, it becomes us dependent creatures not to waste the bounties of a beneficent providence. It is given to sustain life, to excite gratitude, to fit for the active service of God. Everything should be applied to its appropriate end, and nothing should be squandered or lost. From Barnes, notes on the Bible. Mm. How important, and perhaps that's one of the, <laughs> can be, kind 
tragic when you see the waste that goes on. Mike? Yes, I was going to say what's fascinating to me is in this version, I mean, this episode of the feeding of the 5,000, there were 12 baskets left, and then in the other one of the feeding of thousands, there were seven baskets left over. just thought that was, shows the spiritual nature of the whole thing, too. It shows the infinite abundance of God's love for us. But you can see, if, if you continually yeah. waste, and waste and waste, maybe the, the stream of abundance does dry up. Use what you have. You know, the, this idea of people always charging on their credit card, wanting more and more and more, spending way above their ways and means. There's no but if you wait, I'm sorry. Go ahead, no. If you waste, you don't treasure what you have. It means you don't treasure it, you don't value it, and what you don't value, you will lose. So. Thank you. It's ingratitude, isn't it? Mm-hmm. What does Mrs. Eddy say about ingratitude? Unforgivable sin. Mm-hmm. Yeah, ingratitude is the unpardonable sin because when you are ungrateful, you lock yourself out. You do yourself harm. Gratitude is what brings all the good through. Gratitude is the clear light. It's the clear consciousness that allows the good to come through. Mrs. Evans used to love to tell the story when she went to a practitioner's office and I guess she threw her coat on the floor or something. Mm-hmm. And then her, her yeah. practitioner snapped at her, pick that up and hang it up. Are you grateful for it? <laughs> um, <laughs> Said it taught her a tremendous lesson, and then the practitioner said, "If you were more grateful, you would have more." How true! <laughs> How true! And many people, I don't even, I did not know what the word gratitude meant. I thought just saying a thank you, sending a thank you note, that was gratitude. To really feel the deep gratitude for God, to, to love His creation, to feel it welling up in you. Be so grateful for life, truth, and love every day. Not always thinking about what you don't have, but thanking God for what you do have so that you're happy and in the right mind. That's I think what... it's the same kind of... Sorry. Go ahead, Mary, when you finish. You said that. Oh. Is... Go ahead. No, I was saying it is the same, you know, level of gratitude we should have for the truths that we learn along the way. You know, the the simple ones in the beginning, that's all you know, the Lord is my shepherd. I mean, if you treasure such a a truth, then if anything comes up, at least you will know that you have something to start with. And if you use it, it's amazing. Your thought is in the right direction to begin with, and you will hear more. I have found that very important in my journey. Very true. Just like we say you take the two loaves of fishes, you take the one truth you know and you build on that, and it will multiply. And honestly, you know, all that we offer free at this church, we pour it out. There could be a lot more gratitude for it. I'm, I'm sometimes amazed, you know, Monday morning will come and people will just call with their problems. <laughs> no, no gratitude for anything that went on. I wonder, gee, did they hear a word of it? Did it make any impression on them at all? Or did it just, you know, oh, hum, here it is. Well, sometimes a good thing is the last thing they say. And it's like, right. oh, well. <laughs> Mrs. Evans, is just, she made a requirement for her patients start every phone call with what they were grateful for. And this is why. Because that is the negative human mind. What's wrong? And oh, by the way, yeah, something something wonderful did happen. <laughs> so if you find you are lacking, maybe you need to have more gratitude. Look within. Like you read from finance, that 
Thanksgiving and recognition go together. Yeah. Make sure you're recognizing. It's amazing. I, I think about it a lot now. <laughs> Before coming here, I don't know, I, I thought life was, was one way, you know, like really bad or something. But now thinking back, I realize I had a lot. And I just was incredibly ungrateful. <laughs> Yeah, me too. Oh, my. Thank you very much for this because I realize with all the cooking I do, I always forget to be, it's such a habit, I forget to be grateful about the uh, spiritual nature of receiving it and having it. And uh, this is Eddie and Jesus, Christ Jesus, were so perceptive of the spiritual behind it. And uh, mm -hmm. you know, also from... Uh, what Gilbert Carpenter wrote in this book, in the foreword, he says that uh, it wasn't the uh, fear of the food that was offered to Mrs. Eddy that she thought was going to kill her, but it was the killing of her spiritual thought that was important behind how they prepared the food. And she was so perceptive of it that uh, once she said to Mrs. Joseph Armstrong, who was cooking for her, Mary, do you love me? And the reply was, yes, Mother. And then Mrs. Eddy said, and I wish you would put a little bit... I'm sorry. And I wish you would put a little more of it into my cornmeal mush. <laughs> yes. Uh, could you repeat the title of that book? Yes, it's Recollections of Mary Baker Eddy, and it's uh, The Diary of James Gilman, and it's whatever, put together and compiled and introduced by Gilbert Carpenter. Thank you. Welcome. I think it is on our book page. <laughs> it is on what? I think it is on our book page. Yeah, I think we have yeah, that. I think so. Yeah, I looked at that cornmeal mush. It doesn't sound very appetizing, but yeah, it's very similar to... Very nutritious. Yeah. Yeah, and it's easy to make. It's still, you can find the rest. She, she the fancy it. name is Polenta. Oh, is it? Okay. She had it <laughs> every morning. But that, I think that's the whole point, is, is that when it's done with love, it's delicious. Absolutely it is. A different taste. Yes. And I you know, she, she spends a lot in watching person arguments talking about various poisons. And, uh, it's a taste of thought. So, um, interesting to read that. I, I read somewhere that uh, Mrs. Eddy, there was a window to, between the kitchen and the dining room where she was served, and she would blow them kisses uh, as they gave her food. This <laughs> is some gratitude, probably. Right. Okay. So all this time on first question. Should we go to question two? Well, let's give it a shot. See what we got. <laughs> <laughs> question number two. What was the miracle or divine law that Jesus demonstrated on the sea going to Capernaum? John 6, 16 to 21. So what happened? <laughs> yeah, what happened? Bruce, what happened? He walked on the water. Even though there was a storm raging. So again, did, 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 did Jesus perform a miracle? <laughs> He demonstrated the law of God. Yeah, the so-called so-called laws of nature were no hindrance to his going where God wanted him to go. He was sent somewhere by God, so he obeyed. Again, this is obedience. This is not performing some magical act. God wanted him on the other side of the sea. And the so-called
so-called laws of nature could not hinder his getting there. Well, and he was motivated by love because his his disciples were very frightened by the storm. So he went to comfort them. So the title of one of the commentaries was Always remember, your lifeguard knows how to walk on water. (laughs) 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 So what is it that he cannot do? That he's tremendous love. It it is I, be not afraid. So beautiful, that. Yeah. It was divine love that sent him. But again, these were the laws of nature that say you're going to think. This reminds me of uh, Christ My Refuge, stands at four and five. And o'er earth's troubled, angry sea, I see Christ walk and come to me and tenderly, divinely talk. Thus truth engrounds me on the rock upon life's shore, against which the winds and waves can shock, oh, nevermore. Thank you. I had the hymnal open to that page. I don't know whether we're going to say anything better than that. Well, you'll sing it on Sunday, tomorrow, so. Oh, wonderful. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Ever since I was a little child, I would weep every time I would sing that hymn. Oh, my goodness. The hymn, oh, dear. Many nights, tears. That's I, was afraid, I was afraid I was going to weep while I read it. Divine love is a tremendous power. It should bring us all to our knees. Gratitude for God. It's such an answer to that question, am I a God afar off? Just in the presence, the presence of God. And, you know, at first they were, they were frightened by, it seemed like an apparition, then they realized it was the Christ. And so we must remember, you know, sometimes when we are going through a very, very hard time, it can be the, the very Christ there, but we might be frightened, you know, or being imagining about what it is, what's happening. So remember that it is, fear not, it is I, be not afraid. And this is Eddie Wright and Delaney. The true Christian scientists are not, a fri- not frightened at miracles. It's interesting. And oft times, small beginnings have large endings. We've seen in these stories. So remember, your lifeguard knows how to walk on water. Anyone else? Anybody want to answer question number three before we stop? What does it mean to... Him for the loaves and the fishes. What does that mean? It is one of the material abundance that they saw. This was the group that heard him preach God's truth and then were fed. He knew their thought. It was a bit of a rebuke, wasn't it? That they were seeking him because he fed them with bread instead of they should have been so grateful for his opening their eyes 
to who and what God is. To have been seeking that, seeking God, and seeking the principle behind the effect. He knew that they were looking for um, for the materials they were dissatisfying them, uh, the food, the the very um, uh, uh, just the material, (laughs) food, clothing, water. I mean, just the basic kind of thing. They were not. He, I think, he showed some frustration that they were still not getting what he was about. And how many people come to Christian Science because they want to be healed? Period. It's interesting to note, if you go farther down into this same chapter, Jesus speaks of this principle and starts talking to them more directly about this truth. And all of a sudden, there's a point where it says, Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it. He said unto them, Doth this offend you? And then you go a little farther down toward the end. <clears throat> From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. And then this is where he goes on to say, and Jesus said to the twelve, Will ye also go away? And then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? And that's almost the end of the chapter. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. He lost them. They were offended by the truth, as do we at times. People will come to a certain point, and they, they don't want to grow anymore. They just don't. Maybe they get offended at what they feel is being required. They, don't, they don't want to lose their most cherished sin. Beliefs. And beliefs. But when you get to the point, where, where where can we go? What is there but this? Then you keep trekking on, or the hillside steep. Right. You get to where you acknowledge and recognize that God is all. There isn't anything else. There's nowhere else to turn as his 12 disciples. Then you're on safe ground. Thank you very much, Betty. Yeah. Thank you, Betty. Thank you. 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 Thank you.